What I want to do uh, in this talk is kind of bring it, bring, bring this whole discussion of contemplative science down to the local level to talk about what we're doing here at VCU and in the surrounding Richmond VA community. And what I want to start is by asking you to imagine the brain as a Swiss army knife, you know, the most fabulous Swiss army knife you can imagine, many, many tools. And of course, one of our favorite tools is thinking. We love to think, uh, even though sometimes our thoughts can drive us crazy, we also place a great deal of value on it. And in higher education institutions like this one, it's one of the main priorities of us as educators is to train people to be strong thinkers. But more recently, there's been a growing interest in so-called uh, soft skills or non-cognitive skills uh, for people in uh, corporate settings and other kinds of institutional settings, really with this recognition that to be a, a good, whatever it is, employee, doctor, team player, it's not enough to have a strong intellect. So for example, there's been uh, a lot of interest in motivation and in mindsets and in willpower or self-regulation. I want to suggest with all of these kinds of skills, what's fundamental to them is the quality of our attention that we give to whatever is we're doing. So when it comes to motivation, for example, this concerns, well, what kind of goals do we pay attention to? And why are we paying attention to those goals? When it comes to mindsets, it concerns, for example, if we have a, a growth mindset, what are we uh, giving our attention to uh, in terms of skill development to grow. And when it comes to willpower or self-regulation, of course, it's a matter of, well, what are we, what are we, uh, what are, what are we exercising our will to pursue? Is it healthy kinds of outcomes or unhealthy kinds of outcomes? So this notion of, of attention as being such an important and fundamental skill is not a, a new uh, recognition. Uh, it goes back at least as far as William James, who noted this in his uh, uh, Principles of Psychology, one of, I think, actually the first textbook in psychology, published in 1890. The faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is at the very root of judgment, character, and will. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence, but it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. Now, you may have a sense of where I'm gonna go with this, is in the last you know, 100 uh, plus years, we've really learned to uh, uh, address that kind of open question that James had about how do you cultivate this kind of, this kind of capacity. And this gets us into uh, uh, a realm of what we might call in, in broad terms contemplative practice. And just to, to bracket that a little bit, what we're talking about here is a different kind of learning, a different kind of self-inquiry that is very experiential in nature. Uh, and what we're talking about here is less so much the, the kind of uh, thinking we're doing, the kind of cognitive skills that we're exercising, but actually how we, we embody uh, through this organism a way of being in the world that is very uh, uh, intelligent, we could say, and that helps us to learn things that the intellect is not so good at. So here's the kinds of things that uh, contemplative practices, and here we can be talking about uh, mindfulness meditation or yoga or different kinds of martial arts. And in fact, probably anything you could imagine could become a contemplative kind of exercise. Here's the kinds of things that has been associated with improved focus and attention. Uh, again, because this is such, so fundamental to what contemplative practice is all about. But also the kinds of things for which attention is so fundamental in uh, supporting reducing stress, enhancing creativity, aiding in the exploration of meaning, purpose, values, and helping to develop greater empathy and communication skills, supporting a, a loving and compassionate approach 
to life. Now, there's been a great deal of uh, recent attention to uh, various kinds of contemplative practice, uh, mindfulness being uh, perhaps one of the most popular ones, uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, uh, news uh, attention, for example. Also, many apps out there, and you know, Judd Brewer, who you uh, may have just heard, spoke about a couple of these uh, devoted to very particular kinds of uh, uh, outcomes. And of course, many books. And you know, my sense of like when uh, an idea has bled into the popular culture is when there's a complete idiot's guide to it, a dummy's guide. And of course, more recently, a coloring book. So there are also many uh, outlets for which uh, people are learning how to practice mindfulness and related skills. Uh, this is uh, one of, uh, I believe, Judd Brewer's primary home, Center for Mindfulness at uh, University of Massachusetts Medical School. This is a program that was first developed at Google and is now spread to corporations all over the place, including uh, Ford, a motor company, and Comcast, and uh, American Express, LinkedIn, et cetera, where people in corporate settings are, as I mentioned earlier, learning that having a strong intellectual uh, skill set is part of what it means to be good at one's job, but it's not enough. Also, uh, this kind of work is has been bleeding into schools uh, at various levels from uh, really kindergarten on up to uh, higher education. Uh, this is one that I'm um, quite familiar with, Mindful Schools. And as of uh, fall of 2016, this program had trained up three quarters of a million children in mindfulness in schools all over the country. And Perhaps very importantly for us who are interested in, in building a strong uh, evidence base for these kinds of practices, Mind and Life Institute has been a strong promoter of this work, really wedding the, uh, the science, rigorous science, with the study of contemplative practice. There's also been uh, a real upsurge in uh, research on these kinds of practices, including meditation, mindfulness, uh, yoga, and uh, importantly as well for us who do science, uh, uh, an increasing number of NIH-funded studies on these topics as well, particularly in the last uh, 10, 15 years. So to just kind of give you a sense of this evidence base by way of uh, trying to give some indication of what application it can have to educational and particularly higher educational settings. What, uh, what contemplative science is really all about is this uh, very interesting uh, dialogue, if you like, between different disciplines, including uh, cognitive neuroscience, developmental psychology, uh, philosophy, including phenomenology, psychiatry, and other uh, fields. And they're all... Uh, have this common interest in the, the development of human potential, what it means, if you like, to live fully and very skillfully and very healthily. And it's drawing upon uh, new ideas from the field of positive psychology, renewed interest in the role of culture, social uh, relationships, uh, learning environments, in development across the lifespan, as well as drawing upon advances in our understanding of neuroplasticity. Now, neuroplasticity, which, uh, again, Dr. Brewer uh, touched on some research on this, in case you're not familiar with it, it, it refers to this notion, which is really, comparatively speaking, a relatively recent notion, that the brain is not a fixed organ, so that by the time we reach 18 or 20, we're, we're carved in stone. We're learning that it's much more malleable. You could say it's much more like uh, uh, silly putty, if you like, than uh, a rock. And what we're talking about here are changes not only in the functioning of the brain that can come through mental training of various kinds, but also uh, changes in the very structure of the brain. So when we 
give our attention to certain skill development, certain structures of the brain can enlarge or shrink according to the usage that they are uh, employed in. And we are learning that this uh, contemplative way of, uh, of being, this mindset, if you like, looks quite different in the brain than the, the more common, what we're calling here the narrative mode of processing in which whatever we encounter, whether it's out there or in our own minds, is filtered through these ideas, memories, beliefs, appraisals that we have about things that we encounter. And often, uh, it's a very interesting exercise to do to just walk around, notice yourself as you go through the day, and see how quickly that uh, the things that we encounter will generate these thoughts or emotional appraisals about what we encounter. It's so-called experiential processing, which again is like a, an umbrella term for this contemplative mind, if you like, is much more about uh, allowing what we encounter to, to be taken in much closer to how it actually is rather than how we think it is or believe it to be. And uh, I just want to give you some sense of the, the kinds of uh, understandings that we're learning about the contemplative brain, if you like, about how it does impact the kinds of uh, outcomes that we're all interested in. One of the things that we have, uh, scientists have uh, been discovering for some time now is this notion that this connection between the brain and body is very much a bi-directional one. So what we think, what we feel can have impacts at the physical level, and also what we do physically can also impact our brain functioning. And when it comes to uh, contemplative practice, in this case uh, mindfulness practice, it can have impact on what's happening at the biological level. So this is a study that uh, colleagues and I uh, published last year with folks who received mindfulness training versus a uh, relaxation training and showed that the mindfulness training had these, uh, these uh, produced these changes in the functioning of different parts of the brain, including the prefrontal cortex, and those changes in the brain impacted immune functioning and particularly immune markers that are uh, strongly associated with and reactive to stress. There's also been uh, some very interesting work conducted in kind of a real world setting, and, and it's, in a sense this is kind of a, another take home message is, well how does this kind of training that people get change the way that they actually think and feel and behave in the real world? And this is a, a very interesting study <clears throat> published uh, several years ago uh, in the journal Science showing that people spend about half their time uh, when they're probed on a day-to-day -day basis thinking about stuff, and particularly thinking about stuff that is not uh, pertinent to what's actually going on in the, situ in the situation. They're time traveling. They're in the past, they're in the future, and perhaps more importantly, the more time people spend in this mind-wandering kind of state, the less happy they are on a day-to-day -day basis. Or we could say conversely, the more time that people spend actually with what they're doing or who they're doing it with, the happier they are. So how does this, uh, and this is really just you know, touching upon a very, uh, if you like, kind of uh, uh, very specific kinds of areas in which contemplative science is investigating. But what I want to do here is turn this to asking, well, how is this relevant to education settings. We could also ask, uh, well, why do we care? Because, you know, arguably those who are in college and who are in college degrees are, are quite privileged. Why should we dev be devoting our attention to, uh, to students who are in college? You may have heard this uh, analogy that if the worlds were a village of 100 people, one of those 100 people would have a college degree. But 
perhaps, you know, I'm uh, speaking to the choir here, knowing that none of you are based at this fine institution or have college degrees, is that really what higher ed is all about, at least in part, is training uh, leaders for the future in whatever area of expertise they decide to go into. So in, in a sense, what we're interested in asking is, okay, how can we create strong leaders, not just strong intellectually, but strong as whole persons, which of course can there, thereby have a uh, trickle down effect or downstream effect on the, the people that they touch in their day-to-day -day lives. We're also interested in, in asking, well, how can we change the way that faculty, staff do their job to serve, if you like, as role models, potentially, for what it means to be a healthy whole person. So where I want to start is just kind of give you some sense of what the science has, has had to say about the, the relevance of uh, contemplative practice and a contemplative uh, education to uh, the academic setting. So back in the 18th century, uh, Samuel Johnson uh, wrote this, that the true art of memory is the art of attention. Now, of course, memory is a big, pe a big piece of what it means to learn. If the mind is employed on the past or the future, the book will be held before the eyes in vain. So what we've been interested in starting our line of inquiry and in asking about the, the application of contemplative practice to higher ed is, can it actually make a difference to these intellectual, academic kinds of skills that our students are being taught? So what you see here is uh, data from a study in which folks were randomly assigned to receive a, a brief mindfulness training and another condition in which they got the same training but uh, very much simulated what happens in a real world context where maybe focused on something but they're being distracted by various things around them. And then a control uh, a group of folks who received no training. And what we found here was that when they were tested on their memory for a text material after they'd received their training, the folks who had gotten the, the, the mindfulness training showed significantly better episodic memory in terms of how much of the text they were able to recall. Samuel Johnson also noted that this, what is read with delight, is commonly retained. So he's really, in a sense, kind of saying, it's not just about attention, it can also impact our motivation. Because pleasure always secures attention, but the books which are consulted by occasional necessity and perused with impatience seldom leave any traces on the mind. And no doubt we're all familiar with that. And so what we asked in this same uh, study that I just noted is, well, okay, aside from helping people to remember things better, can it actually shift what they're interested in, what they're curious about learning? And what we found was that, again, those who had received this mindfulness training uh, reported more intrinsic motivation for doing this, which was a pretty mundane kind of reading task. In other words, they were reporting they were more interested in it, they were more curious about what they were reading, they were enjoying it more than uh, those who <clears throat> were in the other two conditions. What we also found was that those who received the training, uh, by way of this enhanced interest and enjoyment of what they were doing, in fact, produced these results in their, uh, their, their cognitive, in this case, memory capacity. So really, what we showed here was kind of like a three-point chain. Mindfulness training impacts not only attention, but even the interest in what one is paying attention to, which can then have uh, uh, some significant uh, cognitive changes that are relevant to academics. Here's some work from some colleagues, again, with uh, college students who uh, received either mindfulness training uh, spread over two weeks, uh, classes, 10 minutes of practice every day, versus a group that got uh, nutrition training. 
And then they were tested on their working memory capacity in this case, working memory being uh, this notion of what can we hold in the mind uh, and work upon it, if you like, to solve problems, uh, et cetera. And what they found was uh, in comparing where they started before the training to where they ended up, their working memory was, was uh, significantly better amongst the mindfulness trainees. And they also tested them on their, their verbal fluency or their reading comprehension. Uh, in this case, through the verbal portion of the graduate record exam and found the same result. Those who'd received mindfulness training performed significantly better on this test, which uh, those of you who are in education know that perform performance on can make a big difference in terms of uh, whether students advance to a graduate or other kinds of professional training. Now, work in uh, contemplative practice has been uh, focused on academic-related outcomes, but also on health-related outcomes. And this, of course, is part of this uh, mandate, if you like, to ask, what does it mean to be a healthy student? And so how, there has been some, uh, preliminary work uh, addressing uh, how mindfulness training can impact unhealthy habits. In this case, uh, a study on uh, smokers, college students who are smokers, and asking, you know, with five hours of training uh, spread over uh, uh, a series of uh, several days, can this make a difference to their, uh, their consumption of cigarettes? And what you see here in the red are the pre-training levels of cigarette smoking, and the mindfulness trainees versus relaxation trainees. And in the green are the post levels of smoking. And what you uh, see, I think, is very apparent is this quite dramatic reductions with uh, mindfulness training relative to relaxation training. Here's another study based on even briefer kind of training, in this case, only 11 minutes. So this was a single laboratory session in which students came in, they received very brief mindfulness training versus a control training. And then they were followed for a week afterwards. And uh, what they found was, again, the mean number of cigarettes smoked per day was uh, significantly reduced relative to the controls. So this is a very interesting line of inquiry that is, that is happening, and uh, really in a, in a number of areas, showing that, that it doesn't necessarily take hitting hitting one, oneself with a hammer, so to speak, to train up the mind, that even relatively brief trainings can produce at least short-term kinds of outcomes. So imagine what it would be like if one were giving oneself this kind of exercise every day over a period of months or years. Potentially, these kinds of changes and others could be sustained. There's also been uh, some very initial work on mindfulness interventions for college student binge drinkers, which again showed uh, reductions, significant reductions in binge drinking amongst college students relative to those who didn't get this training. So we're really uh, at the ground floor in terms of asking about the, the relevance of contemplative practice to higher education and, and education more generally. But it's a notion that is coming onto the map. And uh, so take this from a very authoritative source, Wikipedia, which you know is, is also you know, some indication that at least the powers that be decided, hey, contemplative education, that's got some legitimacy. Let's put it up on Wikipedia. It's a philosophy of higher education that integrates introspection and experiential learning into academic study. So really talking about an, an integration of these different kinds of education to support academic and social engagement, develop self-understanding, analytical and critical capacities, and cultivate skills for engaging constructively with others. Now, if that sounds like a really big mandate, again, uh, what is it that contemplative practice is doing? It's training this very fundamental capacities that we have for attention, for awareness, capacities that there's probably no domain of life that is not 
impacted by them. So if it seems like a panacea, <clears throat> uh, it's not to say that it is. It's to say that it can have effects in a whole variety of ways, just given how fundamental this kind of skill training is. Here's a, a little more. The inclusion of contemplative and introspective practices in academia addresses an increasingly recognized imbalance in higher education. A lack of support for helping students to learn who they are, search for a larger purpose for their lives, and leave college as better human beings. We could say not just smarter human beings. So this notion of contemplative education, it's not new. It's been around in uh, other cultures uh, for uh, uh, really uh, centuries, although uh, it's also been true probably for the same amount of time that it's not easy. Uh, you know, <laughs> if you've ever tried this, you may notice there are certain challenges to doing this kind of work, including sleepiness and other things. And, but it's also something that is, is increasingly being recognized as important in higher education. So what you see here is really just, a, a, in a sense, a partial list of institutions in uh, this country that are uh, formally building in contemplative education initiatives into their curricula, into their extracurricular offerings. And uh, most recently on this list is VCU. So what are we doing here on this campus to promote this kind of thing? Well, again, we're very much at the early stages, very much the ground floor of this. Uh, this contemplative core was only established a little more than a year ago. Uh, so here's, here's uh, some of the initiatives that are currently underway. Uh, the WELL, which is the uh, VCU's campus wellness center, is making a variety of offerings to train people in mindfulness, including extracurricularly, but also around these kind of high stress periods in which uh, uh, students really struggle. Uh, exams, for example. It's also been integrated into the recreational offerings, yoga classes, including a mindfulness-based uh, yoga and other kinds of physical practices. There's also an artfulness initiative that is asking about, hey, how can, how can art be a vehicle, if you like, for bringing this, this, this kind of work to the world? And really a whole host of others, including a number of initiatives that are designed specifically for uh, students who are struggling with substances of various kinds. And also for those who are uh, simply want to become uh, more uh, healthy human beings. So let's return back to our, our long-suffering student here and ask uh, what, uh, what, what, what's the goal, what's the vision here? So this is uh, the one page in the Kobe website uh, that outlines what the Contemplative Science and Education core is all about. And I encourage you to check that out if you want to see the kind of research initiatives that are underway, the various faculty uh, and staff were associated with this initiative, as well as the various course offerings that are uh, speaking to this interest in contemplative education. But here's just a few things that are on the table for us. We're uh, networking faculty all over the humanities and science campus and the medical campus to come together to do collaborative kinds of work that can uh, move this initiative forward. We're interested in creating a new learning opportunities, and we've just mentioned a few. There are more and more, it seems, every uh, month, new kinds of learning opportunities for students, for staff, for faculty. Uh, we're also in, very interested in partnering with uh, community organizations. Uh, to, if you like, kind of bring the work that's happening here into the community, as well as to ask how can what's happening in the community uh, serve and be of interest to those who are on this campus. And this, as I said, is a very new initiative, and we're very interested as well in fundraising to uh, expand the, the scope and the impact of the work that is beginning here. Thank you. Thank you.